please open your New Testaments to the Gospel of John. We want to continue to study from that book. You'll remember that in the Apostle John's introduction to his Gospel account, he introduces his readers to another man named John, who was called John the Baptist, the baptizer, the immerser. And that's because he was busy about immersing people. Mark 1.4 says that his baptism was a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. It was for the Jews, and the Jews who were not living right under the law of Moses would repent of those sins, turn back to living as the law of Moses taught them to, and to believe the message that the Messiah's coming, he's at hand, the kingdom's at hand, and then be baptized for the remission of sins. This was, of course the way that God chose to prepare the Jews to receive their Messiah. And we know that that was a limited work for only that time before Jesus came. And you'll remember that over in Acts 19, we have the account of the establishment of the church in the city of Ephesus. Now, Apollos had been through there, and remember, he knew only the baptism of John. That's all he was preaching, but... He was preaching it after it was null and void. And so Aquila and Priscilla had took him aside and taught him the way of the Lord more perfectly, though he was an eloquent speaker. He just didn't know what he needed to know. Well, when you come to Ephesus in Acts 19, uh, Paul found some people there, and they evidenced that they had only known the baptism of John. And thus he baptized them scripturally. Now understand, I say scripturally, because the baptism of John was only in effect before Jesus Christ came, or before he came, and while he was here as Jesus and the apostles and the disciples on the limited commission did the same thing. It was all designed to precede the coming kingdom, and we need to keep that in mind. John came to prepare the people. For those who heard, believed, and obeyed him, they were prepared. Now if you're prepared, you still don't have to get ready. So that's what happened. But once the Great Commission baptism is in effect, the church, of course, is established, then people to obey the gospel had to go through the steps in the plan of salvation, believing in Christ, repenting of their sins, confessing their faith in Him, and being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, the Lord adding them to His church. Now, a lot of times people don't recognize that. It's not going to make any difference to us today except that we want to be right with what the Bible teaches uh, because nobody has any kind of John's baptism being preached today. Uh, there's a lot of baptisms being preached, and some of them aren't scriptural. And thus, people ought to seek to be scriptural, even as those people at Ephesus, when they had obeyed John's baptism after it was out of effect, out of effect then they came to know the way of the Lord more perfectly, and thus they were obedient to the gospel, and Paul baptized them. Now, John came then to bear witness of the light. Verse 7 says, The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. So it is the light, Jesus Christ, who brings salvation to the world through the light of the truth of the gospel. Well, not only in John chapter 1 and verse 8 does the apostle John make it clear that this other John was not the light, but he says so again, he wants to be sure, he says so again in John 1, and if you look, he does it 19 through 20. And this is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? But he confessed and denied not, but, I, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he said, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. Then said they unto him, Who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. So he understood his mission. He understood his work. And he didn't hesitate to let other people know that he was simply preparing the way for the Lord. Well, why did... And there might be several answers to this, but I'll show you the one I'm really wanting. Why did John the Baptist bear witness of the light, the, the eternal word, the Lord? Very simple. 
that people might believe. That's exactly what it was. Look in verse 7 of John 1, and you'll see that's exactly what is said. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light. Why? That all men through him might believe. And this is the same reason, as we studied in the first lesson on this, that John's writing his gospel. John 20, 30, and 31 makes it clear that uh, he intended to bring people to belief. And we ought to understand that the miracles causes one to accept Jesus as the Son of God. His fulfillment of prophecy caused people to recognize he was the Messiah. We ought to recognize that the miracles done by the apostles proved that the word they spake was from heaven and not from men. So we understand that faith doesn't come by miracles. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. But how do you know it's the word of God? Well, they confirmed it with miracles, signs, and wonders following. If you look at uh, Sergius Paulus when Paul and uh, Barnabas got to Cyprus, he's a prudent man. He sent to hear Paul. And you remember Bar-Jesus tried to come between him and uh, teaching, that is, between Paul and teaching uh, Sergius Paulus. And uh, Paul calls Elamus, who was his other name, he caused him to go blind. And... Um, that was a sign. But have you ever noticed that it says that uh, Sergius Paulus believed because of the message? You have noticed that? It never mentions that the miracle impressed him other than what? Well, what were miracles trying to do? Well, the words this man speaking is from heaven and not from men. So faith does come by hearing the word of God. Before John the Baptist came as a forerunner of the light, there were, of course, others who spoke of him. And it was a wonderful thing that down through the years, all of this preparation was done, ending in this very special effort of John the Baptist doing his work. And all this, remember, was at the end of the Mosaic economy. They spoke and they wrote of the coming Christ. Now, since our Lord's return to heaven, the Lord's church has the divine obligation and privilege to declare Jesus Christ to be the solution to the greatest problem man has, of which there's no greater, and that's the sin problem. He is the light of the world. You have the Old Testament prophets then. They foretold the sufferings of Christ and the glories that were to follow. Peter wrote in writing part of the New Testament, talking about the prophets who wrote in the Old Testament of the coming Christ. He tells about them and how diligent they were. Listen to how he describes it. 1 Peter 1, verses 10 and 11. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. What does that tell us as they search their own writings, knowing the Holy Spirit guided them to write those things down? What were they searching when they searched diligently and inquired about well, they prophesied, it says, of the grace that should come unto you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. He's simply saying those Old Testament prophets knew they were speaking things about the Messiah, and they search their own writings and the writings of others trying to figure out when that's going to take place. Because remember, Paul said in Galatians 4, in the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son. They knew He was coming. Now you must realize all of these prophets, prophecies were being considered in the days of Christ. The Jews were looking into it. They too were trying to figure these things out. The prophet Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 7:14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah 7, 14, I say again. Then for unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given, and the government of his, um, will be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever, 
The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this, chapter 9, 6 through 7. But again from Isaiah, the suffering servant, which we've noted earlier, chapter 53, 4 through 6. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions and was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. 53, 4 through 6. Micah prophesied virtually the same thing in Micah 5, 2. There are all these prophecies that we noted earlier that talked about Christ when you're studying through the Old Testament. Then there ought to be those things brought out when you stop to read those particular prophecies. Now the Father bore witness of him. And then, of course, the apostles of Christ. Now we previously noticed these things in particular. They bore witness through the fact that they had been with Christ. John 15, 27. They provided what we call empirical evidence. 1 John 1, 1 and 2. They bore witness through their own lives. They bore witness through their death. And that's something to die for Christ. I don't quite understand what that would be like to actually be warned. Do not preach anymore the name of Christ. You're going against civil authorities when you do. And we'll tell you this one time. It might be a second time. Maybe you'll be fine the second time that you do it. But the third time you're going to jail, and if you keep on, it's going to be worse than that. Have any of you ever faced that? <laughs> I haven't, but the early church very regularly did. All this material we've looked at before, we've examined it. We've seen the testimony that was there. But I wonder, do we realize, and this is where it gets to us, and this ties in with some things we were talking about last week. That is, we, we can't give this eyewitness testimony. Can't do it at all. So how do we do what we're supposed to do in standing up for the Lord? We preach the word. We accept the truth and put it into practice in our thinking, in our lives. And we view all things through the truth and we deal with ourselves, our brethren, and everybody else as the truth says we ought to. Now there are times, some of us, because we're not always very agreeable on things, we might like to just bong somebody upside the head. But we don't because who controls our lives? Who tells us how to deal with one another? Well, the Lord does. He tells us exactly how we interact with one another, even when sometimes we're not too pleasant and we don't deal with one another like Christians ought to. But I'm thankful to say there's always been people around who did subject themselves to the will of Christ and who did not uh, give the same as they received when that uh, thing they received was a bad thing. So how do we show forth Christ living in us? The only way you can. Putting into practice the teachings of the enriching principles of the gospel of peace. Remember that we're to do all things by the authority of the Lord. Colossians 3.17 And you'll remember that Jesus pointed out in John 17, 19 through 23 speaking to his Father and for their sakes I sanctify myself. Now think about that. Has Jesus left us an example that we should walk in his steps? Yes. Specifically, that's said by Peter concerning how to suffer for the cause of Christ. He left us a pattern to follow. But notice what he did. He says of himself, I sanctify myself for their sakes, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Now, pause there for a minute. In other words, what I do in obedience to God as the Savior, I do for the benefit of others. I place myself aside, and I do it for the benefit of others. If Christ were to take the view that a lot of people do, well, what are my rights as the Son of God? Well, he never would have come. He never would have tabernacled in the flesh. 
He never would have cared anything about us. But the love of God is so great, even to those who spurned God, rebelled against God, though he never did anything but good for man. And they got themselves in the pickle of being cut off from God. And if they die that way, they're lost forevermore. What does he say? Well, I'll go down there to that world that I made perfect and they've corrupted. And I will still live in that corrupted world that they corrupted. And I will show them how to live and that it can be done. And so he did. So he says, neither pray I for these alone, that is the apostles, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Folks, you were prayed for by the Lord when he prayed there. I have believed on Christ through the word of the apostles. Their testimony. And they proved they wrote the will, or spoke the will of God because of the miracle signs and wonders. They confirmed that they did. And you know, once those, that word was confirmed, it is forever confirmed. People say, well, that was 2,000 years ago. Doesn't it need to be confirmed again? We don't understand confirm when we say that. When a thing is confirmed, it is confirmed. There's no reconfirmation. A few more years go by and there needs to be a re-reconfirmation. Well, by now, I don't know how many re-re's there would be. Because after the apostles died and the last one they laid hands on, the miracles were out, out of the church. That would be roughly around 100. Do you mean then the people at that time needed to have it reconfirmed? No. It was already confirmed and once confirmed, it stands until somebody can prove that the apostles are liars. That's what it comes down to. So he prays that we all may be one. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. Now note the in us. All spiritual blessings in heavenly places are located somewhere. Paul says, Ephesians 1, 3, are in Christ Jesus. And I know of but one single solitary way to get into Christ. A believer who's repented of sins and confessed his faith in Christ is baptized in to Christ. Galatians 3.27. There is no other doorway. There just is not. Does that not tell you why when Ananias, who was selected by the Lord as the preacher to go to Saul of Tarsus, who at that time was a believer in Christ, evidenced by his fasting and prayer, he was penitent. And it also says that his prayers to God were not saving him from those sins. And his fasting wasn't saving him from his alien sins. So when Ananias got there and understood the situation, he knew he was a believer and repentant. His very actions were showing he was confessing Christ. What does he tell him to do? Well, if he's not a ready candidate to be baptized for the remission of sins by the authority of Christ, I don't know who would be. And he knew it. And he said, now, what are you waiting on? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. That's the way you become a Christian. No other way. And today, when we stand up for the doctrine of Christ in life and doctrine and in defense of the same, then we're heralding forth the best way in the world that you can show forth Christ to the world and that's what the world needs notice what he went ahead to say and the glory which thou gavest me I have given to them that they may be one even as we are one I and them and thou and me that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that thou sent me and hast loved them and thou hast loved me John 17 19 to 23 thus he is saying that the true New Testament unity built upon the authority of the scriptures is one way we declare to the world that Jesus Christ is the Son of God no wonder the world uh, spurns what is called Christianity denominationalism says we'll just be divided every way we want to go believing in God the Father and Christ and doing as we please and that ought to convert Islam, it ought to convert the Hindus, it ought to convert the Buddhists. But that's one of the things that Jesus prayed that wouldn't happen. That's not unity. That's not oneness in Christ. So we labor under the authority of Christ to keep ourselves knit together. So through our unity, our unity we magnify Jesus Christ. And we don't magnify Him when we don't keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace that Paul writes about in Ephesians chapter 4. Jesus was sent by God to a lost world. Why? 
because God loves the lost people in the world. We, in, as spiritual as the spiritual body of Christ and members in particular, should have the same attitude though, toward those outside of Christ. We should view them just like God does. They need the gospel. We will them the best that heaven can will them, salvation of their souls. Thus we do what we can to know the truth, to live the truth, to defend the truth, and to reach everybody we can with the truth. Now they may reject it, for they rejected Christ while he was on the earth. But we've done our part, and we sing the song, Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother? Well, that's exactly what we do at every opportunity. And we pray that God will providentially provide ways that we can get the truth to others. So these things should cause us to understand how Jesus thinks about God's desire for all things to be done decently in order, as we talked about earlier. And we should see what it uh, says about the evils of pride, of envy, of contentiousness, of strife among and between church members, and the very existence of human denominational churches, and so on you could go. We know what the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, said about this kind of division. Remember a few weeks ago we said there is a division authorized by God. There is a division condemned by God. There is a unity that is authorized by God. There is a unity that is not authorized by God. And when you look at 1 Corinthians 1, verses 10 through 13, you're easily able to understand that here was a division that was condemned by God. They were running after different preachers, if you please. And Paul says, were any of those crucified for you? So he said, you ought to be of the same mind and the same judgment. Well, that's interesting. Because I come on later on, and I see Paul and Barnabas not able to get along with one another. You notice that? That their, dis their difference was so sharp, they couldn't work together. Well, did Paul violate what he wrote in 1 Corinthians 1.10? That they ought to be of the same mind, same judgment? Well, here it takes a little study to understand that Paul's talking about things that are obligatory. Things that are obligatory. There will always be times when two people can work together, and there may be times when they can't. But that doesn't mean that either one of them has necessarily violated God's will. It was the case in Paul and Barnabas. Because the church commended both of them. Paul chose Silas, went back to the churches where he and Barnabas had first gone on the first preaching tour. Barnabas chose John Mark, went down to Cyprus. And out of there, two of the best men that ever were in the church, out of their disagreement, two missionary journeys were formed. You never find them running one another down. You never find them backbiting one another. You never find the church saying, well, we support one group, we don't support the other one. Because they differed over how it was to be done. There will always be those differences, brethren. In the Lord's church, no matter how much Bible you know and how well you live it, there will always be some people who work together better than other people. And there will be some that will say, well, for now, let's don't. Now let me tell you a little secret. A husband and wife who love one another, just like God says, sometimes walk out of the house and sit down and be of themselves for a little while. Just leave me alone. Let me cool off. Let me be by myself. Don't bother me. Well, I guess they are ready to divorce immediately. They hate one another and are seeking one another's demise. No, they're human beings. They need a breather. And they find out right now, it's just best to live alone. And then if you're what you ought to be, you don't hold any grudges. You let things blow over and you go right back. And you don't throw it up in one another's face anymore. Now those that start throwing stuff up like that in one another's face, and that keeps going on, you get a practice of that, you're going to have bad trouble. But you never find that when it comes to the dissension that was so sharp that Paul and Barnabas couldn't work together. We need to know the unity that's condemned, and we need to know the unity that's commended. We need to know the difference in obligatory matters, which we must all believe the same way. And we need to know that, well, maybe I can work with so-and-so better here than I can work with so-and-so better over there. But I don't have any ill will toward any of them when we're both still doing what God authorized us to do. We have, it's amazing what God has done and how he allows for our humanity and for personalities at times to say, well, uh, I got up on the wrong side of the bed today. 
Usually you ask somebody else, did they get up on the wrong side of the bed? Because you don't ever get up on the wrong side of the bed, do you? <laughs> so we all recognize there are those areas that don't necessarily have to do with violating God's will. It's a good, better, best situation, and it falls in the area of options. And it wasn't a good option as far as Paul was concerned to take John Mark with him. Barnabas said, I think it is. Well, Paul says, no, I don't think it is. Barnabas said, I think it is. So let's just part company. And that's what they did. But you don't find them all blowing up one another. If you want the unity among brethren that ought to be there, you're going to have to understand the difference in obligatory matters, which we must all believe and obey. And in those matters, it don't make any difference. But I don't know that we're to that yet. So we must know what's what that we might be worthy of the calling of Christ Jesus and the unity of the Spirit that we're to keep in the bond of peace and just how that's done. They had transformed lives. They were really converted. And the best example of that is Saul of Tarsus. What they had been that was against God, in the case of Saul, vehemently against God and his will and the gospel, and then as much for him as he had ever been against him. 2 Corinthians 3, 18, 4 through 6. Christ influenced their life because they wanted it to. They took to heart the truth that says, this is now what you must believe to be acceptable to God. This is how you're to live to be acceptable to God. It's the truth of Christ that teaches us how to live righteously and holily, Ephesians 4, 17 through 24, and nothing else. It'll tell us the difference between optional matters, which have to do with how do I discharge this obligation, and the obligation itself. And if we don't get that well in hand, uh, we're going to have problems over a lot of things, and we have in the church over the years when people couldn't tell about that. See, the Judaizing teacher was taking something that a Jew could do if he wanted to and be a Christian, be circumcised, keep the law at that time. He could keep lots of the law that had nothing to do with doing it in order to be saved by Jesus Christ. But he never had the right to put it on Gentiles. Well, they never were given that law, Deuteronomy 5, 1 through 5. And that we sometimes don't recognize because we don't walk back into that time period and that temporary period as they were all moving from Judaism under the law, under the gospel, and leaving the law behind. And the problem that created among the Jews who become Christians because they just couldn't turn loose. And they always wanted the Gentiles to be second-class citizens like the proselytes under the law of Moses. But it wouldn't be so, and Paul made sure that that was clearly understood. So as we bring the lesson to a close, what is it we're to be doing in the meticulous things the New Testament authorizes us to do in our worship and our other activities? Well, listen to what Paul said to the church at Philippi. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed. Wouldn't you like that on your tombstone to be true? I've always obeyed Christ. That's a marvelous thing to live that kind of life. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not when I was there, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and do of His good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Philippians 2, 12 through 16. Now, you know, I think verses like this should make each one of us do some close scrutinizing of our own thoughts, purposes, and motives. We could, we're simply saying, how transformed am I? What's the difference in being an apostate member of the church who doesn't care anymore, though he might at one time did, or those out there in the world that won't even hear the gospel? Is there a difference in me, in my thinking, in my planning, in my purposing, in what I do with my life? This should make one then think that way and realize that we have to renew our minds, Romans 12, 1 and 2, if we are to be yielding our bodies as living sacrifices to Christ. 
So here's the challenge. It's always there. I don't care how long you've been a member of the church, how long you studied the Bible, how many people you may have led to Christ. This is the challenge we will always, we will always have, to keep ourselves faithful to the Lord, to proclaim the Word, which Word bears witness to Christ that He is the Son of God. Our duty as the elect people of God then is to proclaim Jesus Christ and Him crucified and defend the gospel of Christ, 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10. And this should make us think of how little we use these things as they ought to be. And sometimes we remain silent when we ought to speak up. We have an obligation to carry out the Great Commission to the best of our ability where we are and we fail often, but it should be something that is renewed in our minds to where whatever I didn't do that I should have done, tomorrow I resolved I will not commit that sin of omission. Because all too often we're looking at sins of commission when we ought to be looking at our sins of omission. So what am I omitting in my life that I need to incorporate into it to make me a transformed, truly converted person, one who is genuinely from the heart, steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. If you're not a Christian, we urge you to become one. We've studied how to do that. If as a child of God you have sinned, we urge you to repent of those sins, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. And may we go forth from this place faithfully serving Him and testifying, even as John did, that Christ is in us as we obey the truth and the truth active in our lives declares Christ and Him crucified. So if you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.